welcome to our online service. Today, the Sunday before Easter, marks the beginning of Holy Week. That period of eight days taking us to the celebration of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so for followers of Jesus, this is the most important time of year in the church calendar. It is a week that displays the full power and character of the person that we call Lord, Saviour, Master and Friend. A week of great sorrow and great joy. A week of sombre intensity and yet full of life and freedom. You know, and this morning we're going to be looking at some of those um, times. We're going to be looking at some of the emotions shared and we're going to be discussing them. So on this first day of Holy Week, we recognise the greatness and the power of God as we come together and we join in the ancient praise of God's people from Psalm 50. The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, from Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him and around him a tempest rages. He summons the heavens above and the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my consecrated ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice and the heavens proclaim his righteousness for God himself is judge. Amen. Uh, an awesome and sombre psalm of praise to ponder as now we listen to Esther setting the scene for us this Holy Week. Today is Palm Sunday. It is the day, exactly one week before Easter, that we remember Jesus rode into Jerusalem to the cheers of the crowds who waved palm branches and shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hundreds of people, possibly thousands, exclaimed Jesus as their king. He was the descendant of David and they thought he had come as their Messiah to overthrow the Roman occupying forces and re-establish the nation of Israel and usher in a new age of peace and prosperity for they, the people of Yahweh, the one and only true God. But as we know, it didn't work out like that. Within a few days, Jesus was betrayed, arrested, tortured and condemned. The crowd who had shouted Hosanna now shouted, crucify him. Jesus sinless and righteous in every way, was executed as a criminal. By Friday, Jesus was dead, dead and lying in a tomb. It looked like this was the end. Shocked and devastated in despair, the followers of Jesus didn't know what to do. How could this be? How could their master, the one who had raised the dead, calmed the storm, fed the 5,000, healed the lepers and changed countless numbers of lives, be dead? What about the message of the coming of God and that he had preached? What about the good news that God had now arrived and he was going to lead them into a new future? Was that all gone? Was there no hope? Were their lives over too? Would they just have to go back to fishing? How could they possibly bear that? How could they ever get over the trauma of the past few days? Where was this peace beyond all understanding that he had promised just a few days ago? Mary, Jesus' mother, didn't know peace. She had watched for those hours as the world turned dark and her beloved son was torn to death on the cross. Peter didn't know peace. His last words in the master's hearing had been to deny that he even knew Jesus. There would never be peace for him again. For two days they wept and were battered by the storm of emotion and circumstance. They yelled and they blamed, they cried and tore their clothes in grief. All around them, the enemies of Jesus, both human and satanic, rejoiced. But they, the ones who had loved Jesus and followed him, were in pieces, lives shattered by the horrific events that had just taken place. But on the third day, as dawn arrived, the world changed. The sun rose with healing in its wings, breaking over all layers of creation. The creator rose again to new glorified life. The world was changed and would never be the same again. Jesus was alive. 
and as he stood revealed to his followers the wounds in his hands, feet and sides still evident, Jesus spoke the words that would resonate down throughout history and into eternity. Words of power, words of promise, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Thank you, Esther. Thank you for sharing that. Peace be with you. You know, during this past year, with the world turned upside down, there's been both the impetus and the time to kind of some, ponder some of the big questions. Now, despite my knowledge of the Bible and the fact that I've been a Christian for over 40 years, I, I do actually recognise that I'm, I'm not always what I would consider to be a really deep thinker. Have you ever heard of the Christian philosopher and this amazing bloke called Dallas Willard? Well, I've been listening to some of his teachings on YouTube and so much of what he says is absolutely amazing. And so much of what he says goes completely over my head simply because I'm actually, I'm not clever enough to follow what he's talking about. You know, but one of the questions that I've been asking myself is, how would I define a healthy soul? You know, I love the Lord. I seek to follow him. I want to be conscious of his presence in my life at all times. Uh, and so if I was living, if I was living in such a way that I was in tune with God, you know, that it wouldn't feel like there was something wrong or something missing. What, what would that feel like? You know, if I were actually asked the question, how would you measure success in the Christian life? How would I answer you know, would it be that I've led 10 people to Christ this past year? Would it be that all my daughters were walking with God? You know, would it be that our church finances were in such good shape that we actually had some reserve for future ministry needs? You know, and, and honestly, all of those things would be really nice. But no, no, they wouldn't be indicators that my soul was well, to use the beautiful phrase from that hymn. I think the way that I could know that I'm walking in the ways of God, that I'm following my Lord Jesus, and that I'm satisfied in my relationship with him, is, is if I knew real, true peace. The kind of peace that actually makes me laugh with joy, because my heart is totally, 100% at rest with my Saviour. Now, now, I'll be honest with you, I actually haven't tested this theory out with anyone else, um, so perhaps it might be different for others. But I think, I think peace would be a pretty good indicator of, of when all is well with my soul. I, and I do find it interesting that in Hebrew, the word peace, usually translated peace, is shalom. And shalom is used as a greeting, as a blessing and a prayer. The word shalom means more than just a desire for peace, lack of conflict. It is actually the hope of a holistic sense of well-being for the inner life. A, whole, a soul that is whole, blessed and at peace. Shalom. So perhaps my attempt at deep thinking is kind of on the right track. I, I would welcome, I'd welcome your thoughts and your ideas on the subject. Well, this morning, as we look at the Beatitudes, at this manifesto of blessing that Jesus declares, we read, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Now, I don't think it is coincidence that this one, this Beatitude, comes at number seven. All the first six of Beatitudes, I think, lead to this one. Without knowing that you're poor in spirit, how can you find peace with God, yourself or others? You know, someone who has gone through trials and grief and mourning and received the comfort and consolation of God will know his peace. Meekness, strength under control, obviously leads to peace. A heart that hungers and thirsts for righteousness and also those who desire God with a pure heart will be seeking peace. One who is merciful, 
or find peace, whilst of course those who do not forgive, who do not offer mercy, will never be at peace. How is your peace level today? And I'm not talking about the peace of having nothing to do because we are still in lockdown and then therefore everything is just so boring. You know, and I'm not talking about an easy life where there are no problems or difficulties or conflicts. Those situations test peace, you know, as we'll be coming on to. I'm, I'm talking about the peace of your soul. I'm talking about the fruit of the spirit peace that grows in your life every day. You know, I'm talking about your relationship with God that provides the calm harbour when the storm is raging. I'm talking about the green pastures and the still waters that we inhabit because the Lord is our shepherd. There are many aspects to peace, but I want to highlight three this morning. The first is peace with God. This is what Jesus achieved for us on the cross. You see, he was the fulfillment of this beatitude. He was the peacemaker, the prince of peace. In Colossians 1.20, we read, Through Christ, God was pleased to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross. Because Jesus died, taking all the sin upon himself, he paid the price for us. Through faith in Jesus, repenting of our sin, we are forgiven. And therefore, we now have peace with God. No longer do we need to fear punishment or become overwhelmed by our guilt and shame. We can be free and at peace because we're forgiven. Do you know that peace? Do you live in it every day? You can. The second aspect of peace that I want to look at is the peace of God. Now, this is so beautiful and precious. This is Jesus, who was called the Prince of Peace, saying, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. Peace. Peace that God gives to us. It's a peace of heart and mind and soul that is not natural, you know, and it's not human in nature. It's not like the peace that the world promises. It's not based on circumstances or the situation, but it's based on the close relationship that we have with God. It is, according to Philippians 4, 7, the peace of God that transcends all understanding that will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It is the kind of peace that everyone is looking for, even if they don't realise it yet. It is a peace that is found in Jesus. And I believe it is vitally important to understand as we look at the eighth beatitude, which we'll come on to in a moment. Thirdly, there is a peace with others. Peace in our relationships. As Paul says, if possible, on your part, live at peace with everyone. And it is in these three areas that we are called to be peacemakers. You know, we are peacemakers when we, when we share the gospel of Jesus Christ and we share his love and we help others find peace with God. We are peacemakers when our life of peace impacts others. There was a Dutch Jew who became a Christian before being deported to Auschwitz where she died. Her name was Etty, Etty Hilsium. And she said this, ultimately we have just one moral duty, to reclaim large areas of peace in ourselves, more and more peace, and to reflect it towards others. And the more peace there is in us, the more peace there will also be in our troubled world. 
When I was in my early 20s and living in southwest Belfast in a really, really rough area, I held a Bible club for kids in my home. Could, I, one day I had about 40 of them in there. Well, well, there was one particular occasion, two young girls, about the age of nine, ten years old, something like that. You know, they were in my house one day and um, they said to me, Bethany, we like coming to your flat. It's light here. It's not dark like my house. It's peaceful. You know, the peace of God in me drew them in and led those kids to Christ. Are you a peacemaker? You know, peace, a soul at peace, despite the outward circumstances. And there are few circumstances that can be more traumatic than to be persecuted. And yet that, that is the subject of the eighth beatitude, the one that comes next. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, as we discussed the other week, righteousness in the Bible is about being in a right relationship with God. So in this beatitude, Jesus is saying that those who are persecuted because of their faith are favoured. Well, come on, be honest. Do you normally feel blessed when you're insulted and mocked for being a Christian? And what if the persecution is more than that? What if you, what if you lose your life? your family, your health, or your freedom. Yet Jesus says you're blessed. We're going to listen now to Mina's story. Just a warning, it does describe great trauma and it is very emotional. But watch this with me. They told my boys to lie down on the floor. Later I saw them bringing my husband inside. They uh, tied them, them like this at the back. They were asking him whether he has another money. He said, I don't have it. What do you want from me again? The other person answered and said, today is your day, tomorrow is not yours. So when I heard this, I started praying. I said, please help me, Lord. I was just calling Jesus. I said, Jesus, 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 have mercy on me. Lord, if I die today, what of my fatherless children? From there, they took the van and all of us that were there and took us to Sabisa. So we stayed there in hardship, trauma, hunger, fear. They used to send their imam to come and preach to us. And after the preaching, they will ask us, who amongst you that want to denounce Christ so that we will take her and uh, give her to our people to go and stay with our women and have freedom. And by his grace, we all join our hearts that none of us, by his grace, we are not going to denounce Christ. For us to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I went into my room and knelt down and prayed before I came out. There, I started singing a song that says, By His grace, I am alive. That's why I'm singing. Jehovah saved my life. A person that has gone into this trauma has so many things. There are fear, uh, isolation, anger, and so many things. But after that training, all came down 
by His grace. Open doors helped me to realize the love of God. They care for those that are suffering, those that are in trauma, those are, that are in trouble, making them to realize that God still exists through people. I could have been somewhere in it, the land of the dead by now. I was just saved by His grace. Can you imagine? Her home broken into, her children tied up, her husband murdered, uh, and she reports that her sons were beaten so badly that they spent a month in hospital. And then, after that, another incident, to be kidnapped and held hostage for eight months. To be free, all she had to do was deny the Lord. And yet, Amina remained faithful. She faced persecution like Jesus did. She kept her faith. She kept her soul's peace in God. Her husband laid down his life. What Jesus said was the ultimate expression of love. In so many ways, Amina also laid down her life for her Lord and proved that those, as Matthew 16, 25 says, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. You know, is it any wonder that Jesus promises that those who suffer so much for him will be given the kingdom of heaven? I am challenged by these two Beatitudes, challenged in the very depths of my being. You know, peace is good when the sun shines and the daffodils bloom. But true, real peace of the soul is not dependent on the outward circumstances. Peace, peace changes me. It changes the world around me. And it is tested most strongly when others declare war on you. I'm challenged, can I be? the peace of God that shines like the light in the darkness. You know, if I can, then I will be known as a child of God because it, because it is the nature of Christ, the Prince of Peace, that people will recognise in us. What an amazing calling. What a beautiful, powerful walk we are called to as we follow Jesus. And so as we come to the end of these few last few weeks of pondering the Beatitudes, you know, looking at the countercultural manifestation, manifesto of blessing that Jesus declared to those who would give up their all and come follow him. How has God spoken to you during this season of Lent? And as we enter into the remembrance of Holy Week this week, you know, let us seek him. Let us seek him, his righteousness, his peace, walk his way. Let us come and submit our lives to him. And in the same way that he laid down his life, let us lay down ours and say, Jesus, I'm following you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, our Lord God Almighty. Over these past six weeks, we have heard your voice calling, a voice promising blessing to those who come to you poor in spirit. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love and your kindness. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your Holy Spirit poured out upon us, enabling us to meet you, to be changed by you and to walk your way. This morning, Father, we are challenged. We are challenged by your call to be peacemakers in a world that so desperately needs to know peace. May we know ourselves the power of your peace that brings that change. And may we shine it as a light, drawing others to you through the peace that we share. 
May we be walking in that right relationship so that peace becomes the hallmark of our lives, even when and if people mock us because we trust in you. And Father, we pray. We pray for our brothers and sisters like Amina who are suffering persecution. We think particularly of Nigeria at this time, of the terrible, devastating um, attacks that are taking place there, the ongoing kidnappings, Lord. Lord, please, please will you bring a resolution in that situation. We thank you for the work of Open Doors, that they are bringing peace and healing to those who have suffered such terrible trauma. But Lord Jesus, we intercede on behalf of the nation of Nigeria, and ask, in your name, Jesus, will you bring healing and peace? These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We will be joining together on Zoom this morning at 11am for fellowship and discussion. Please do come and join us. And also on Friday, it will be a joint service with Wormley Church for Good Friday at 6pm. The details will be in the email and I'll be posting them out this week as well. So please do join us for that. I'm going to finish this morning. I'm going to finish with the ancient blessing spoken over the children of Israel in Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Have a blessed week.